Before the video begins, I want to address the lack of uh, Super Staff Roundup videos recently. So a while ago, I started working on a Staff Roundup for someone named Kaizawa Yukio, who is actually a storyboard artist for Super. And I was actually getting pretty close to finishing it, but then I found a few interviews online that looked kind of interesting, but they're in Japanese, and I unfortunately don't know enough to be able to translate it yet. So I've kind of hit a roadblock there because I don't want to make the video until I know what the interviews say because I really want the video to be good and if there's some really good information in those interviews then I'd like to have them in the video if I can. So I'm sorry that it's taken so long. In the meantime, I am going to be working on another one, so please stay tuned for that. Again, sorry for the wait. Just wanted to clear that up really quick, and enjoy the video. Dragon Ball Super Episode 47 is pretty fascinating to me in a variety of ways. It served as not only the start of a new arc, but also a glimpse into the somewhat healthier production environment that is Dragon Ball Super today. Tate Naoki and Ishikawa Osamu both served as animation supervisors here, leading a pretty small key animator list. Without further ado, let's get right into it. The first interesting thing to note is that there's actually not a previous episode recap for this episode. That means there's about a minute of entirely new animation before the title card. As of now, this is the only Dragon Ball Super episode to not begin with a recap of some kind. This is a fairly bold move for a series with a production like Super's, but it's definitely effective in terms of setting the tone and building the atmosphere. It's also animated pretty decently. Tate Naoki handled this segment, and there's some cool movement here and there. I particularly enjoy how Goku Black Shadow zips around in the air. What really stands out here is Tate's effects work. Fire, smoke, explosions, they all come together brilliantly as a wonderful way to start off this episode. This is all Tate through and through, with a few keyframe corrections serving as the only hint of someone else's presence. This is practically the story of the entire episode, as Tate commands the vast majority of work himself. After the title card, Tate handles the scenes of dialogue between Trunks and Bulma. Ishikawa Osamu pops up here occasionally as well, mostly just to provide corrections to close-ups. It's pretty standard stuff until Black shows up where we get a brief snippet of Tate's loose character movement when Trunks shields Bulma from an explosion. This is the scene where Black manages to grab Bulma and kill her in a fairly dark manner for Super. Trunks barely manages to escape with time machine fuel in hand. But while not mind-blowing by any means, this scene is definitely visually interesting. There's some decent effects animation on display here, primarily in the form of explosions and fire. The horror and despair of this moment is captured very well thanks to the directing and the storyboarding. Bulma basically being vaporized managed to be fairly disturbing without being overly graphic. I also really like Trunks' expression here. It's so full of shock and fear. I also love the part where Trunks is running down the hallway and the fire is just chasing after him. It looks really cool. This was, in my opinion, one of the most well done scenes in this episode. After that traumatic experience, we cut to the main timeline, where Goku and Piccolo are harvesting lettuce. This is Tate as well, and it's a cute little scene. There's also an interesting flashback here to early Dragon Ball. I'm not sure who animated it, but it looks pretty cool. There's not much else to talk about here since it's mostly dialogue. About 11 minutes into the episode, we get more future Trunks material. This part is mostly dialogue as well. But it's worth noting since it's one of the few parts where Ishikawa's style really comes through. It's pretty polished and on model, which is typical of Ishikawa's work. He's a very solid supervisor in his own right. After the eye catch, it's back to the present again. This scene is fairly strange since Tate seemingly pops up again, but it's heavily corrected Tate. He's not completely unrecognizable. But many people like Chief Animation Supervisor Ide Takeo left their own touches on it. It looks somewhat bizarre compared to the rest of the episode, but I guess it doesn't look completely awful. It looks pretty fine for what it is. Let's skip forward once again, 
back to Future Trunks and Mai. Ishikawa's supervision pops up once again, as does Ide's. After some dialogue, Trunks and Mai head for Capsule Corp, where they are confronted once again by Black, and Tate shows up one last time to deliver the best piece of animation in the episode. Black descends from the sky, surrounded by a menacing funnel of smoke and sparks. Trunks draws a sword and runs toward him. I really love this shot. The sense of scale is so good. This perspective is very exciting, and Kakudo Hiroyuki, who was the storyboard artist for this episode, did a fantastic job here. Black fires a key blast at Trunks, who leaps into the air and generates an attack with a slash of his sword. Black dodges and retaliates by firing more key blasts, which Trunks deflects. This is my favorite part of the cut. I love how Trunks' sword becomes a cool looking smear, and how loose and exaggerated his body movement is. It only lasts for a few seconds, but it looks very cool in motion. Black then looms over Trunks as a giant, cool looking wall of fire before knocking him backwards. One last cool cut that I liked happens here, when Mai shoots at Black. Black shoots back at her, and as the blast is traveling towards her, we actually get some background animation. Background animation is actually one of my personal favorite techniques. This isn't the greatest piece of background animation I've ever seen, but it's still an interesting cut that serves as another testament to the solid production this episode had. Unfortunately, I'm not sure who animated it. Ishikawa really brings his A-game at the end for the reveal of Goku Black. The episode finishes on a high note thanks to his animation, which features very polished and nice character artwork. It was a fitting and well done introduction to the new villain of the arc, and an appropriate send off for a great episode. Episode 47 is still one of the most well animated episodes in Super so far, and it continues to hold up so strongly. Many consider 47 to be Tate's magnum opus on the series, and it's hard to disagree. It's astounding to think about how much he animated, and I'm sure his ability to do so much was thanks to the extra time he received between episode 38 and 47. Six weeks is the normal time supervisors usually get for Super now, and Tate was given nine. That doesn't necessarily mean that he spent nine weeks working on the episode, since I don't know when storyboards were finished, but it's clear that the production environment was better than it typically is for this show. That being said, his massive workload is probably why a few scenes, like Vegeta training with Whis for example, are a little rough around the edges. Still, I think he did a phenomenal job. I think Ichikawa deserves some props too. His scenes do look nice, and I think he compliments Tate well. I do wish he would have handled a few more dialogue scenes though. If New Type Magazine is correct, and sometimes it isn't, Ishikawa and Tate might be teaming up once again this weekend to tackle episode 65. Here's hoping that they work another miracle.